Senator Dizek. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and the Sergeant at Arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. On that motion, all in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Members, will you so kindly stand? Members, today's chaplain is Mr. Dan Erdman from the Emmanuel Lutheran School in Cortland, Minnesota. As usual, following the prayer, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. It's an honor and a privilege to be here today to lead you in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for safely bringing us together as we gather from all regions of our state. Be with us as we go about our day and our work and allow it to be pleasing in your sight. God, thank you for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us as citizens of our beloved country. The blessings of freedom, democracy, education, life, liberty, and religious freedom. Hold us firm in your grace and continue to grant our country prosperity. Thank you for the wisdom, knowledge, leadership, and civic engagement you have given all our public servants. Be with them today as they do their work, seek compromise, conduct peaceful debate, and above all, guide and sustain them to make the best decisions possible for all the people of our state. Aid them in doing their work honestly and diligently for the betterment of us all. Heavenly Creator, protect us in our travels today and throughout the week as we venture home to our family and loved ones. Guard us, our family, our friends, and our colleagues against all harm and danger. For all that you have given us today and always, we are grateful and bless your name. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, members. The secretary will take the roll. Abler, Anderson, Barr, Bolden, Carlson, Champion, Coleman, Swadzinski, Dames, Dibble, Dornick, Dreheim, Draskowski, Duckworth, Diedzik, Eichhorn, Farnsworth, Fateh, Frentz, Green, Grunhagen, Gustafson, Hoschild, Herr, Hoffman, Housley, Howe, Jasinski, Johnson, Klein, Coran, Kroon, Kunish, Kupek, Lang, Latz, Liskey, Limmer, Lucero, Mann, Marty, Matthews, May Quaid, McEwen, Miller, Mitchell, Muhammad, Morrison, Murphy, Nelson, Umover, Baton, Pappas, Pa, Port, Pratt, Putnam, Rarick, Rasmussen, Rest, Seberger, Utke, Weber, Wiesenberg, Westland, Westrom, Wickland, Zhang. Pursuant to Rule 14.1, the following members intend to vote under Rule 40.7, Pa, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Members, a quorum is present. Members, you can follow along on the Senate agenda. We will move to the fifth order of business, reports of committees. There are two reports to be read at the desk. The secretary will read the reports. Senator Pappas, from the Committee on Capital Investment, to which was referred Senate File Number 677, a bill for an act relating to capital investment, appropriating money for the library construction grant program, reports the same back with a recommendation that the bill be amended as follows. Delete everything after the enacting clause and insert. And when so amended, the bill do pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Finance. Senator Pappas, from the Committee on Capital Investment, to which was referred Senate File Number 676, a bill for an act relating to capital investment, appropriating money for the Safe Routes to School grant program, reports the same back with a recommendation that the bill be amended as follows. Delete everything after the enacting clause and insert. And when so amended, the bill do pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Finance. Senator Dizek for a motion to adopt the committee reports. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the committee reports printed in the agenda and those read by the secretary be adopted, and I ask for a roll call vote. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Any discussion? Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll.
Senator Bowden, reporting those uh, voting under rule 40.7. Mr. President, I report that Senator Pa votes yes. Senator Pa votes yes. Members, please vote. Yes or no, Bruce? No. Members, please vote. Those having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. Those having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 47 ayes and 16 noes. The motion to adopt prevails. Members, please proceed to the sixth order of business, second reading of Senate bills. The secretary will read the Senate file numbers. Senate file numbers 749 and 439. The Senate files have been given their second reading. Members, now proceeding to the seventh order of business, second reading of House bills. The, Senate, the secretary will read the House file numbers. House file numbers 56, 16, and 30. The House files have been given their second reading. <laughs> Members proceeding to the eighth order of business, introduction and first reading of um, Senate bills. The bills listed on today's calendar, you can follow along on the introduction calendar, are given their first reading and referred as indicated. There are some minor changes, members. If you go to page 14, Page number 14, you'll see Senate file number 2173. It's been referred to the Committee on Taxes. Also proceed to page 17, members. You'll see Senate file number 2207. That's been referred to the Committee on Capital Investments and Senate file number 2208. That has been referred also to Capital Investments. As I mentioned, members, the bills listed on today's introduction calendar are given their first reading and referred as indicated. <laughs> Members proceeding to the ninth order of business, motion and resolutions. There's one author's motion to read. Senator Port moves that her name be stricken as chief author and shown as co-author and the name Senator Rest be added as chief author to Senate file number 1372. Senator Port moves that moves that that be stricken as chief author. Members, there will just be the notion that we will adopt the author's motions as one motion, including that which was read. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Herr. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that uh, Senate file 1336 uh, be stricken and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. And this is your bill, Senator Herr? Yes, this is my bill and the, uh, the committee chair I have been aware and talked to. Thank you. And they agree? Yes. Thank you. Senator Herr moves that Senate file number 1336, that is number 24 on the general calendars, be stricken and re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those, on, uh, all those who approve say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. <laughs> Senator Hochschild. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate file 1632 be withdrawn from the Committee on Labor and be referred to the Committee on Education Policy. And this is your bill, and, uh, and both uh, chairs agree? Yes and yes. Thank you so much. Senator Hochschild moved that Senate file 1632 
be withdrawn from the Committee on Labor and re referred to the Committee on Education Policy. Any questions? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. <laughs> Senator Fate. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I move that SF 1697 be withdrawn from the Committee on Education Policy and re referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. Uh, this is my bill, and I've spoken to both chairs. Thank you, Senator Fate. Senator Fate moves that Senate file number 1697 be withdrawn from the Committee on Education Policy and re referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. no. The motion prevails. <laughs> Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate File 1729 be withdrawn from the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans and re referred to the tax. Uh, to the Committee on Taxes, and Mr. Chair, I've talked to both chairs, and they do approve this re-referral, and I am the author. Thank you, Senator Dames. Senator Dames moved that Senate file number 1729 be withdrawn from the Committee on State and Local Governments and Veterans and re-referred to the Committee on Taxes. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate File 1815 be withdrawn from the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans and be re-referred to the Committee on Taxes. I am the author of the bill. I've talked with both chairs, including myself. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Senator Murphy moves that Senate File Number 1815 be withdrawn from the Committee on State and Local Governments and Veterans and re-referred to the Committee on Taxes. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate File 1955 be withdrawn from the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans and re referred to the Committee on Agricultural Broadband and Rural Development. It's my bill and we're all good. And when you say we're all good, that means both, uh, both chairs agree? Yes, sorry about that, Mr. President, yes. Thank you. Senator Putnam moves that Senate file number 1955 be withdrawn from the Committee on State and Local Governments and Veterans and re-referred to the Committee on Agriculture, Broadband, and Rural Development. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. <laughs> Senator Umu Verbaden. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate File 1213 be withdrawn from the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans and given a second reading and placed on general orders. I'm the author of this bill. We already received a hearing in higher education and mistakenly referred it to uh, State and Local Government and Veterans. Thank you. Senator Umu Verbaden moved that Senate File Number 1213 be withdrawn from the Committee on State and Local Governments and Veterans given a second reading and placed on general orders. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. The secretary will give it, give it a second reading. Senate file number 1213. Senate file 1213 has been given a second reading. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I move that Senate File 1338 be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety and given a second reading and placed on general orders. This is my bill, uh, and uh, I have talked to the committee, uh, the uh, committee chair, and unfortunately, this was merely a mistake in uh, forwarding it from one committee to the other. The Judiciary Committee had already heard it and it was mistakenly re-referred back to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you, Senator Carlson moves that Senate file number 1338 be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety and given a second reading in place on general orders. 
The secretary will give it its second reading. Oh, all those in favor, all those approved say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Now the secretary will give it its second reading. Senate file number 1338. Second reading. Senator Liskey. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move that Senate file 1499 be withdrawn from the Committee on Taxes and given a second reading and placed on general orders. All right, and you want to give a little explanation about it? And I would like a roll call on this. Uh, it, the explanation is that we have a pretty high priority on helping our taxpayers. Uh, here as a Republican, I voted that we would be giving the surplus back, and this does exactly that. And Governor Walls himself stated that he'd give half, and that's exactly what this bill is going to do. Senator Ress, to the motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I would urge members to vote no, and I understand a roll call has been uh, requested. Um, this, um, although there was no explanation of what the bill is, I would ask members to look at Senate File 4 1499. Uh, the provisions of that bill are going to be part of the governor's uh, tax bill. We are hearing it this week. There is absolutely no reason um, to prematurely bring it to the floor. Um, please vote no. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Any if further discussion? Senator L uh, Liskey moved that Senate file 1499 be withdrawn from the Committee on Taxes and given a second reading and placed on general orders. Mr. President. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I do have uh, some more discussion regarding this bill, if that's all right with you. First, I'd like to ask if Senator Liskey would yield for a question. Senator Liskey will yield. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate that. Um, it was mentioned that maybe we're not exactly familiar with uh, what your bill would do, Senator Liskey, so if you could let us know maybe as it pertains to the taxpayer what your bill is seeking to do and how much they could expect to go back to them uh, immediately. Thank you. Senator Liskey, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my bill will give $2,200 to an individual taxpayer and $4,400 to a coupled paying taxpayer. So a married fi filing jointly would be $4,400 per household. Uh, I believe that this would be enough money to help uh, in situations like covering the energy costs that are rising, other inflationary costs such as eggs. As we all know, uh, eggs cost a lot more than they used to. Uh, so things of that nature, this, this would go directly to helping right away. Thank you. Senator uh, Duckworth, just to make sure that you know that under the rules uh, th that we're not supposed to have any debate on this portion of the uh, motion. And as you know, when Senator Liskey stood, I asked if he wanted to give any additional information on it. Uh, Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate that. And my comments uh, will not be for debate. They will be to uh, the notion of urgency, which I believe is what we're uh, discussing. I think Senator Liskey's bill uh, is extremely timely, and the people of Minnesota would agree it's extremely urgent. Just last week, uh, and why this is urgent, just last week we passed a bill here in the Senate that the government signed, or excuse me, the governor signed just days ago that impacted the number that was forecasted for the surplus. Uh, the number that was reported is $17.5 billion. That's after that adjustment for inflation has been made, which is exactly what I was fearful it would do. The real number that would have been reported prior to that adjustment would have been $19 billion, Mr. President. That's why this bill is urgent. We're passing laws here as a state legislature to artificially underreport the surplus that we're sitting on, and that impacts the decisions we're going to make for taxpayers and how much of that surplus should be going back to their pocket. And one more thing briefly, Mr. President, is this. As Senator Liskey mentioned, uh, the last campaign cycle, voters told us, both Republicans and Democrats, please get up there, do the work of the people, but the one thing we're overwhelmingly asking you to do is return some of the surplus to us. We're fighting inflation, we're fighting the rising costs of living, we're trying to provide for our families, for our loved ones, we're requesting that you eliminate the tax on Social Security. Promises were made, Mr. President, 
Senator Liskey's bill would keep those promises. It's urgent that we pass this bill today, which is why I believe we should take it up. Thank you. The secretary would take the roll. Members, please vote. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Mr. President, I report that Senator Pa votes no. Senator Pa votes no. Those haven't voted that desires a vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 32 ayes and 34 noes, the motion is not adopted. <laughs> Members remaining under the order of business of motions and resolutions, Senator Desick to designate special orders. Thank you, Mr. President. Pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the following bills be made for special orders for immediate consideration. The list is on your desk, members, and we'll start with Senator Kunish's bill. S uh, Sooner, uh, Senator Kunish, Senate File 667. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm very proud to um, bring to you Senate File 667 that codifies uh, the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act into our uh, statutes here in the state of Minnesota. Before I begin, I have, uh, I'd like to present the A3 amendment. Um, the secretary will report the A3 amendment. Senator Kunish moves to amend Senate file number 667 as follows. Page three, line one, strike according to section 260.762. This is the A3 amendment. Senator Kunish, to your A3 amendment that you offer. Thank you, Mr. President. This is simply technical um, uh, improvements and adjustments in the language of the bill. Very simple. It does not change the bill in any way, shape, or form or the outcome. And so I would ask for a green vote. So, Senator Kunis, are you asking for a roll call vote? And I would like a roll call. Thank you. Roll call. Request a roll call granted. I thought that because you asked for a green vote. Any discussion? The secretary would take the roll. I'm sorry, Mr. President, I, I was trying to look up the amendment and it hadn't popped up uh, when you called the vote, so I hadn't had a chance to look at it yet. So, uh, Senator Pratt, is it up now? Are you okay or you need a little more time? Is up now? Okay. Any discussion on it? The secretary would take the roll. Members, please vote. Senator Bowden, those voting under Rule 40.7. Mr. President, I report that Senator Pa votes aye. Senator Pa votes aye. Those voting, those having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 62 ayes and zero noes. The amendment is adopted. Senator Kunish. 
Members, I would like to um, share with you this really important piece of legislation that will enshrine in our legislature um, protections for our Native children. Uh, the United States Constitution recognizes the unique political status of our Indian tribes and Indian people, and this bill, um, through the ICWA Act, Indian Child Welfare, and MIFPA, the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act, are based on that political status of the Indian child as a member of federally recognized Indian tribes, and it's not based on the child's race. Senate File 667 codifies all of the ICWA into Minnesota law to avoid and ensure clarity and continued protections for Indian children, their families, and their tribes. It's really important to know, members, that throughout history, the United States and, the Minnesota, and Minnesota, government and private practices have implemented intentional and horrific methods of removal and disconnection of Indian children from their families and their cultures and their tribes. The need to create a federal law governing the best interests of our American Indian children resulted from a clash among cust customary tribal child-rearing practices. The legacy of boarding schools, of intergenerational trauma, and the continuation of assimilation efforts well into the mid-20th century. I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson for those of you that are not familiar with these things. Uh, in 1819, through the passage of the Indian Civilization Act Fund, it was an act that was passed in the United States Congress, it was designed to disconnect the federal uh, policy of assimilation. The act encouraged benevolent services, both Protestant and Catholic organizations, to provide education for Native Americans and authorized financial in incentives to stimulate the civilization process. In 1891, through the early 20th century, the government used the Civilization Fund Act to, as authority to establish numerous Native American boarding schools. The U.S. government ramped up their efforts in forced assimilation of Native people through the peace policy of 1890, uh, 1868. It was an approach that advanced humane interactions with Native people and allowed religious groups to run reservations across American West initiated by President Grant. These attempts of the federal government to end Indian tribes by assimilation also led to the disproportionate amount of adoption of the Indian boarding uh, school policy. By 1879, forced removal of Indian children from their homes for placement in government-sponsored boarding schools went on in earnest in an attempt to kill the Indian and save the child. Though we don't know how many Indian children were taken at that time, by 1900 there, 1900, there were at least 20,000 children in Indian boarding schools, and within 25 years, by 1925, that number had more than tripled to over 60,000 children. And then came the Indian Adoption Act of 1953, which was not so far away, uh, ago. Many of us in this, um, or many of you in this um, room right now on this floor were alive at this time when boarding schools started to die out and a new effort to disconnect Indian families took place. From 1958 to 1967, the federal government enacted a, a program called the Indian Adoption Project with the goal of white Americans adopting Native children. It was an official effort to lift any obstacles that prevented Native children from the eligibility of adoption and then, in essence, uh, with the spirit of allowing them a better life than what their families were providing. Testimony in support of the Federal Indian Act Welfare, uh, Welfare Act proved that approximately one in four children had been in, placed in, out of home, or foster care nationally with the rate in some states, such as Minnesota, being as high as 35%. So over a, th a third of our Native kids were forcibly removed from their homes, put into foster care, 
and on to adoption by non-Native families. Many of those children were lost to their families and tribes through adoption to those non-Native uh, families. The effect of the trauma, the separation of their families, the disconnection from important cultural teaching caused by the boarding school and adoption eras carry on today. We are still feeling those effects as families and tribes struggle to rebuild extended family and community relationships that help support raising our children. We actually heard from people, from those painful, heartbreaking stories in our committee from our elder 81-year-old Gertrude Buckanaga from White Earth, who was sent away to boarding school along with five of her seven siblings. They were allowed to return after the first year, but after that, some of them were only allowed to return many years later. The Native children had their hair forcibly cut. All their personal items of emotional or cultural value were stripped away, and they were punished if they spoke their Native language or drummed or sang their Native um, practices. Many children did not return. They died, they, uh, some died of, of abuse and neglect, of illness, and they lay buried in unmarked graves across this straight state and across this country. Leech Lake Chairman um, Jackson Sr. and Fond du Lac uh, Chairman Dupee and Bobby Joe Potter all shared their heartbreaking similar stories. For me, it's also very personal. My grandfather's brothers were sent all the way from the Standing Rock Reservation in South Dakota as a young boy to Carlisle Industrial School, 1,490 mi miles away in Pennsylvania. He attempted to run home many times, once making it home only to be forced back to the boarding school. It wasn't until my uncle Collie fell from a train on his last attempt to get home that his leg was cut off and he was allowed to go home. Surveys of states and large Indian populations conducted by the Association on American Indian Affairs in 1969 and 1974 report that approximately 25 to 35 percent of all children, Indian children, were separated from their families, placed in foster or adoptive homes or institutions. In Minnesota, during the years of 1971 to 1972, so again, not so long ago, one in every eight Indian children were living in adoptive homes, and nearly one in every four Indian child under the age of one was adopted. In 1978, non-Indian couples made, made more than 90% of non-related adoptions of Indian children in Minnesota. When judging the fitness of particular families, native families, many caseworkers unfamiliar with the Indian cultural values and social norms made decisions wholly inappropriate in the context of Indian family life. The children were, re were rare, rarely removed from their families because of allegations of actual physical abuse or neglect. Instead, caseworkers and other child advocates often equated single parents, poverty, and community parenting with abandonment and neglect by parents. Prior to the federal enactment of the Indian Child Welfare Act, the courts tended to rely on testimony of caseworkers who often lacked training and insight necessary to measure the emotional risk that the children were experiencing when they were removed from their homes. In a number of cases, the Association on American Indian Affairs obtained evidence from competent psychologists, psychiatrists, who after examining those, those families and those children were able to contradict allegations that were often offered by those caseworkers. This is particularly true when allegations are based on poverty and cultural differences which do not necessarily constitute social deprivation and or psychological abuse. More than 40 years after the passage of ICWA, these same reasons are used today as the basis of removal 
of Indian children from their homes. So in 1978, in response to the crisis and the recognition of the political status of Indians, the U.S. Congress enacted ICWA, the Child Welfare Act. In 1985, Minnesota enacted the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act as a supplement to ICWA to bolster protections against child removal from their families. It was amended in 2015 to add additional protections. Since 2018, our tribal leaders in Minnesota have been intent in strengthening MIFBA after input from a wide variety of key stakeholders. And as a result, tribal leaders tasked its attorneys to assess revisions to support this goal. In a 2020 report from the Minnesota DHS indicated that American Indian kids were still 16.4% more likely than the white kids to be placed out of home. So members, this legislation that bolsters the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act is the gold standard. It bolsters existing protections of ICWA into Minnesota state statutes. This bill codifies the Federal Indian Welfare Act into state law, and it reinforces our state's recognition of the sovereignty of tribal nations and communities in Minnesota. With your help and with your green vote, the passage of this bill will continue to effectively work to protect Indian families, reduce litigation where possible, provide more clarity so that tribes and counties, governmental agencies, all work under the same expectations and understanding of the rights and responsibilities. So uh, Senate File 667 is accumulation of hundreds of hours of work and discussion and collaboration between our Minnesota tribes, the experts, the practitioners, and the legislature, and I ask all of you for your support today. Senator Abler to Senate File 667. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I uh, rise in support of this bill. Um, and just to, it's really complicated if you read the whole thing and you're like, oh, there's a lot of words there. Um, and the whole, and I didn't hear all of Senator Kunesh's comments, but the whole world of child protection and, you know, trying to do permanency establishments is really complicated. It's, it's, it's as messy as anything. And the disparities between uh, Caucasians and African Americans and the tribes are really not very good and it really does matter a lot uh, what your zip code is how it's going to go for you and and so I have done the best I can do in my time as a member and as a chair to figure out a way to make this better and uh, what this I don't think this bill changes anything except that it makes sure it's still there and I think the question to ask there is a federal lawsuit which probably got mentioned uh, which puts the ICWA law at risk, and the question, the, the policy question that comes up is that in the best interest, what's the best interest of the child, what's the best interest of even a culture, and so in the Native American culture, if they can hang on to their family a little longer compared to um, what others might think, uh, it's better, and it's, I've, I've come to believe over the years, Mr. President, that it is better to try to preserve the family units uh, uncles or whoever, and then they, and to delay the permanency rulings, which is what this goes toward. Um, and so I strongly support it. Um, and so the real vote, Mr. President, is if you think it, if the federal laws, if the federal laws not turned over, nothing happens anyway, but if that law should go away, uh, I think the best answer is that we preserve the family integrity as long as possible. Still very concerned about the safety of the child. And that's, even though they've redefined a few terms, I still think there's a high standard of making sure that everybody's protected. So I urge members to vote green. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the secretary will give the bill its third reading. Senate file 667 is third reading. Senate file number 667, a bill for an act relating to children, making changes to the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the secretary oh. Senator Ress. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I just want to thank Senator Kunesh for this bill because it makes a very important, um, has a very important provision with regard to Indian children and obtaining their original birth certificates. Um, that is an issue that is important to uh, many of us for children 
and um, older children as well, adults, to be able to obtain that information. And I'm glad we're making a start with that um, in this bill. Thank you very much, Senator Kunish. The secretary will take the roll on final passage. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Mr. President, I report that Senator Pa votes aye. Senator Pa votes aye. Members, please vote. All those having voted that desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 66 ayes and one no, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. <laughs> Senator May Quaid for House File 213. Uh, Mr. President, do you mean, oh, House File 213. Yes, Mr. President, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. President, um, House File 213 is a short, simple, but very important bill. In Minnesota, food shelf visits are up significantly across the state, more than any year that we have on record. And this is due in large part to the rise in the cost of food, but it is also because of the end of a lot of pandemic era related food supports. The last uh, emergency SNAP payment will actually go out to families in March. And we know that uh, coupled with the already existing food insecurity crisis, we are looking at a huge demand on our food shelves across the state. And so this bill will help food shelves be stocked with the huge increases that we have across the state and in communities. And we know that this emergency funding is actually needed now. Um, I placed on members' desks uh, the statute that regulates the appropriations um, and the data reporting to food shelves and across the state. And I also uh, placed a list of the food shelves who, are, who participate in the emergency food shelf program um, that are eligible to receive funding through this. So with that, Mr. President, I appreciate the recognition and I hope we can all come together to address this crisis in our state. Thank you. Any further discussion? Senator Uskey. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator May Quaid stand for a question? She will yield. Senator Uskey. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator May Quaid, uh, you've given us this list of a large number of food shelves across Minnesota. Did they have to apply to get on that list? Senator May Quaid, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So the way that the emergency food shelf program works is they are um, part of the emergency food shelf program and then they do apply for these grants. And there is an expectation that about 250 to 300 of the 442 food shelves that are part of this program will apply for this grant. Senator Aki. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, this, I guess I'll put it in the form of a question again for Senator McQuaid if she would uh, yield. Senator McCoy, will you yield? She will yield. Senator okay. Uckey. And thank you, Mr. President. I don't know if you'd have this information handy right here, but uh, I happen to have a large food shelf in Park Rapids, the Hubbard County food shelf. They're not on this list. Do you know why they wouldn't at this point, or is that more details than you have with you on the Senate floor? Senator McCoy, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Excuse me. Um, there are the food shelves that are going to be part of this appropriation are part of the emergency food shelf program. There are other food shelves that do exist in the state that are not part of the emergency food shelf program that might be run out of um, different places and, and might have appropriations or fundraising that happen in different ways. Senator Aki. Thank you, Mr. President. And I would assume that they're under that emergency, but I will follow up um, after this and uh, we, I guess we can make sure they're included if they rightfully should be. Thank you. 
The secretary will give House File 213 its second reading. Mr. President. Its third reading, I'm sorry. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I uh, just wanted to stand for third reading real quick. Uh, All right, may we do the third reading? Oh, before third reading, or do you have an amendment? Are you okay? Okay. Uh, the secretary will give its third reading. House File number 213, a bill for an act relating to human services, appropriating money for food shelf programs. Senator Pratt, and then we'll go to Senator Westrom. Senator Thank Pratt. You. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm sorry, I thought, I thought the bill was already on third reading, so my apologies. Uh, Mr. President, I think uh, I'm going to end up voting for the bill. Um, I do believe our food shelves uh, are facing uh, a lot of additional demand as we see rising inflation, food costs going up, family budgets are being strained more and more. I think as Senator Liskey tried to push his bill this afternoon, or this afternoon recognizing that families need that financial relief because more and more are living paycheck to paycheck. But I'm also concerned, Mr. President, that we can't seem to find long-term relief for families when we have a $17.5 billion surplus. We just gave, and, and, and it would have been $19 billion had we not made the change in how we look at inflation, assuming that we're automatically going to spend that extra billion and a half. So I'm going to say $19 billion that we've overtaxed Minnesotans. And Senator Liskey tried to give a portion of that back to help them not live paycheck to paycheck. But I'm also concerned, Mr. President, that while I think this is a good bill, we've spent over $100 million before the February forecast. We've spent over $100 million so far before we have targets. We've spent $100 million in things that really aren't urgent, and we've tried to make that point time and time again. So while I will be voting in favor of this bill, Mr. President, I am very concerned about the spending spree that this Senate seems to be on before we had the information from the forecast today and before we have our target set. And I'm asking the majority to please slow down and let's do this, this process the right way. Senator Westrom. Mr. President, uh, would uh, Senator McQuay yield for a few questions? Senator McQuay will yield for a question. Senator Westrom. Mr. President, uh, Senator McQuay, I uh, just wanted to confirm a few things. First of all, uh, is any of this coming from federal money that the state had received uh, during COVID or some of the relief uh, following COVID, or is this all state general funds? Senator McQuay, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, the answer to Senator Westrom's question is the way that we appropriate money to food shelves in the state of Minnesota is highly regulated, and it specifically says that uh, money will be appropriated from the general fund in this way. And so um, that is where this money comes from, and it's why it's very specific because of the way that it is laid out in statute. Senator Westrom. So, Mr. President, uh, Senator McQuay yield for another question. Will you yield? She will yield. Senator Westrom. Uh, Mr. President, Senator McQuay, uh, just uh, interested to know, do you have more bills coming forward this year? Is this a one-time bill that you see uh, the Senate dealing with, uh, with kind of an emergency situation as they ramp off of some of the federal money uh, that you uh, explained to us? And I guess where I'm going with my concern, uh, Senator McQuay, is uh, are we going to turn this into just a routine habit uh, for the Senate and just more uh, spending as opposed to the private sector that does a lot of volunteering and private donations to our food shelves? Uh, they're really the backbone behind uh, the, the local county food shelves to, to make themselves available. And so can you just explain to, to me and the, the Senate, do you expect more bills like that this year or do you see this as kind of a a one-time uh, uh, emergency, and, and that's, that's what we're calling it, and that's what it'll be. Senator May Quay. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I just, I'm really appreciative of the question because I think I could be a little bit more explicit. Um, part of the reason why this is emergency funding is not because um, federal funds are, are waiting for 
food shelves, but it's because they're waiting for Minnesotans. So the pandemic era related um, programs that helped were eviction moratoriums, emergency SNAP benefits, um, universal meals in schools and breakfasts in schools. And with those going away, the very last payment happening in March for emergency SNAP, which allowed people to take the maximum benefit with the already high number of food shelf visits that we are seeing, we know that this crisis is coming. Um, my anticipation, and part of the reason, uh, just to address something that was mentioned earlier, that this is happening now is because it takes about three months for this process to start from the appropriate appropriation to the application to the approval to the money going to the food shelves themselves and so we're a little bit like three months behind. Um, so this is one time emergency funding because it's really vital right now. However, um, I do know that there is additional increased funding over what is currently existing in statute from the governor's budget that I'm, I'm highly supportive of because we have seen such an increase in food shelf visits and an increase in food security across the country. Senator Westrom. Thank you, uh, Senator May Quay and uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, Senator May Quay, uh, just as a general rule, uh, I know many of our local uh, food shelves are blessed with countless hours from people that give time, uh, local stores, local uh, citizens donate to them to help make it it better in their community. And so uh, while this is uh, an important bill at this time with emergency, I uh, do want to caution us to not think that state government is going to take over what so many county and local food shelves uh, capably do and do to a very good level of giving back to meeting the needs in their local communities. And so. Uh, I just uh, want to make sure that that's, this is a one-time bill, and so thank you for that, that answer, uh, Senator May Quay, uh, uh, because sometimes uh, state money might be well-intended, but all of a sudden, if we start backfilling what the locals are doing so well, uh, we could have unintended consequences, and we want to keep fostering that local donation, that local volunteering to help their neighbors and friends in their community because they can do it much better than government can do. It uh, makes me think of uh, Hubert Humphrey and the quote uh, he was so famous for, uh, the impersonal hand of government cannot replace the helping hand of a neighbor. And so uh, we need to do it in that spirit and keep that in mind. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Would the author yield? Senator McQuay, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks for bringing the bill, Senator McQuay. Um, I'm wondering, Senator, do we know, I mean, Senator, we know our Minnesota Department of Education has squandered away $250 million of the taxpayers' money that was intended to feed children. And there's another $250 million that is still suspect there. It may be as high, Senator McQuaid, as $500 million. We don't know. Um, we have before us a bill, I think, that's got good intentions. It's to, you know, feed people. But um, the taxpayers of Minnesota and the United States of America have been run over once already by at least a quarter billion dollars. What assurances can you provide us that this struggling or failing state government that can't even keep track of a quarter billion dollars is going to be able to properly look after the five million dollars in your bill? Senator McQuay, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And to, to answer that question, um, this is one of those issues where it's um, same topic, highly different process, regulatory uh, standards. So I put on everybody's desk just to make sure everyone has that information, 256E.34, that regulates how food shelves get money, how it's appropriated. Um, they take monthly statistics on people who come into food shelves, and that is reported back to the state. It is reported out in public reports. It is highly regulated and has been so for the 20 or 30 years uh, that the statute has been around. So I, I understand the, um, the question, absolutely. Mr. President, and want members to rest assured that this is an incredibly important, well-regulated, and um, safe thing for us to be doing as a, as a body. Senator Jaskowski. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator McQuaid. Well, that is helpful. Um, at least we know it's not going anywhere close to the Minnesota Department of Education uh, that lost control of a quarter of a billion dollars of the people's money. Mr. President, members, um, I struggle, as uh, Senator Pratt does, with where we're headed here. We um, just received the, the February forecast today. Um, the majority brought forward their inflation bill last week to apply to inflation to the forecast. So we have baked in, uh, of the people's money, we have taken $1.5 billion and baked that into the future budgets of state government. So essentially, we've already spent $1.5 billion there of the people's money before any money has been given back to the taxpayers. And Senator Pratt uh, talked about the 100 million dollars in addition to the 1.5 billion that we learned about today. Here is yet another bill, Mr. President, to spend more money. Uh, we know that that is the interest of the majority to spend money. I'm concerned, as Senator Pratt was, that we are not going to pay attention properly and early in this process uh, to the needs of the taxpayers of this state, the needs of the taxpayers that we heard of, Mr. President, during the election, uh, bipartisanly. And we're seeing bills like this to begin spending away the, the, the huge pile, which used to be $19 billion of the taxpayers' money, and now is already down below $17.5 billion, Mr. President. This year, yet another bill to spend even though it's a small amount, yet more of the taxpayers' surplus. Uh, I hope we can get going in a different direction here because the taxpayers, the hardworking people of Minnesota that had this money over collected from them are not receiving the attention we need to. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator McQuaid. And thank you, members. The secretary will take the roll on, on final passage. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Mr. President, I report that Senator Pa votes aye. Senator Pa votes aye. Members, please vote. Members, please vote. All those voting that has a desired, oh. Those having voted that desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. The bill is passed, but what, there being 60 ayes and seven noes, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Members, back to the agenda. We are now on the 13th order of business. Announcements of Senate interests. Members, without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Housley, 11 to 11.30 a.m. Icorn, 11 to 11.45 a.m. Any addition, any announcements of Senate interests? Senator Desick. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, welcome back. Hope you had a nice uh, few snow days. Uh, I was actually glad that it, it did actually snow. Uh, we will be back in on Wednesday to hear um, a Senator Drayheim bill and a Senator Marty bill. Um, and then we're still deciding what to do um, on Thursday if we'll be doing bills or letting committees do some work. Um, so with that, Mr. President, I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Wednesday, March 1st at 11 a.m. On that motion, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails and the Senate is, is adjourned.